Good evening and uh, welcome to the, let me count, I think it's the fifth installment and the second to last in this year's Cornelio Vute Colloquium. And let me start off by saying that I'm really impressed that so many of you have turned up despite the great German ice storm panic of 2024. I'm from Switzerland, we laugh at these kinds of things, but uh, everyone else seems to be taking it very seriously and maybe for good reason. So uh, we take it as a, as a great sign of your commitment to this series that you actually risk your life to come here and join the debate. Uh, the technical notes uh, up front, you can see that Gloria Danino is here, but Francesco Pitazio isn't. And the reason for that is that Gloria took an early flight, which landed before the great ice storm started. And Francesco was supposed to be on a later flight, and that flight was canceled, which is why he's joining us uh, online via Zoom. He's there uh, with Sophia Loren in the background, yeah. watching over his shoulder. Um, and that means we're going to have a hybrid presentation tonight, uh, tonight and a hybrid discussion. And the voice of Francesco is going to come out of the loudspeaker up here, which we hope is strong enough to fill the entire room with its booming voice. If not, you should probably move a little bit closer to have good hearing of um, the spoken, the hybrid part of the presentation. Um, Gloria Damnino earned her PhD in communication studies from uh, the Università della Pizzeria Italiana in Lugano, which is a young university. It's been around for, I think, somewhat over 20 years. 96. 96, I think so yeah. going on 30, uh, but uh, a very strong university in the, in the field of uh, communication studies. And uh, she is currently um, a research associate um, at the Università degli Studi di Udine in Italy. Um, and she's also teaching at the Università Cattolica, Cattolica del Sacro Cuore, the University of the Sacred Heart, the Catholic University of the Sacred Heart in Milan, which is a, a, a great university and a beautiful university because it's in the center of the city. Um, campus is one of the most wonderful things I know in terms of university campus. But a very high sounding name. And the, and the name is spectacular. And, but that's a, that's a topic for a different uh, uh, discussion. The legal construction, you know, which protects university from too much interference from the Vatican is also quite interesting. But again, that's complicated. We won't go into, we that. Won't go into that. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that Udine and Italy are, um, <clears throat> I would say, the two most important uh, universities in uh, cinema studies in uh, Italy at this point, and among the most important in Europe, which is also why there are partner universities in multiple research projects and in the International Masters IMAX. And our second speaker, or first speaker, depending, uh, is Francesco Pitacio, who is a professor of cinema studies at the University of Udine, um, where he directs many research projects and research centers. He's also one of the organizers of the Udine Film Studies Conference, the Film Forum, which is an annual event and one of the most important events of its kind in, in Europe. Um, uh, Francesco has published variously on film theory, film acting, stardom. Uh, he's fluent in Italian, English, German, Czech, and French, and I think the other language it is. Uh, but he is someone who's done work on stardom in European cinema for many, many years, and uh, thus um, there's a reason why Sophia Lauren is so confidently looking over his shoulder because she knows that uh, she's looking over the shoulder of the real capacity in the field of star stuff. And with that, I hand over to Gloria and Francesco. To Sonia. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, so I will uh, just uh, serve this communication because we had to sort of rearrange a little bit because of this unforeseen hybrid mode. I would say that I will uh, introduce the very, very first slide regarding the project, and then I will hand over to Francesco, who will be leading the first part of the lecture. And then at the end, we have um, a little surprise because we have a special guest um, that I will introduce properly later. Um, 
our guest is, uh, is a very important casting director uh, based in Rome, but I will introduce her properly later. So first of all, thank you very much again for joining us tonight. I would like for being you know, so brave as to defy the, the bad weather. I just wanted to introduce you the project uh, uh, that this lecture will stem from. Um, although if you have, I don't know, is it how many lectures in the uh, in this series have you uh, followed? This is the fifth. Have you followed all of them? All of you? Okay, that is okay. Okay, that's because so. our core audience. Okay, <laughs> it's a captive audience. It's they have a choice, captive right? Captive yeah, that, that explains. <laughs> No, okay, so you're already familiar. I mean, my colleagues have already introduced uh, the project, which is called HC, Aging and Gender in European Cinema, is a uh, uh, four-year project. Uh, uh, Francesco Pitassio is in charge of the Italian unit that uh, researches the intersection of age and gender, in particular in Italian cinema. And I collaborate with, with him. And then we have our colleagues in the French unit, uh, in the UK unit, uh, in the Romanian unit, uh, and the uh, project leadership, which is with the Gunther University uh, here. Um, OK, so this was this is just the uh, presentation of the project. But I think I will skip this, as you are already familiar with that. So I will move the uh, floor, I will give the floor virtually to Francesco, and um, Francesco will deliver his part of the presentation, roughly 20 minutes, then I will jump in and do the second part, and then we will engage, you know, with the, the conversation with our guest speaker. Francesco, mi senti? Thank you, thank you, Gloria, yeah. Uh, so, firstly, I would like to apologize for not being with you today, I would just... Uh, uh, texted with Professor Hediger this morning, uh, and I was saying, uh, no, my flight has been confirmed, but then I drove my way to Venice just to get to know that I, was, I fell one of the first victims of the ice storm. So, uh, uh, frankly, I'm not so fond of hybrid uh, uh, conferences or panels or uh, uh, whatever happens, but uh, it was the only viable option just not to uh, entirely disappoint you, which I hope uh, won't happen. Thank you for being uh, with me virtually and, uh, and at the Cornelia Goethe Centrum uh, uh, in presence. And thank you to uh, Professor Hediger and Cornelia Goethe Centrum for setting this whole thing up. So I will move to my presentation and um, I would kindly ask to Gloria if she could uh, start with the first slide where I refer to what uh, one of the major English actresses, that is Emma Thompson, a few years ago declared in an interview with Vulture, the age thing is insane. It was ever thus. I remember saying years and years ago when I was 35 that they'd have to exhume somebody to play my leading man. Nothing's changed in that regard. If anything, it's worse. I remember somebody saying to me that I was old for a young grant who's like a year younger than me in sense and sensibility. And incidentally, I might add that uh, he got, uh, uh, I mean, he, he, he became older possibly uh, qui more quickly and uh, in, a less, in, a, in a more disappointing way than same Emma Thompson. And Emma Thompson replied, do you want to take a, a flying leap? So Thompson hit the head of the nail by hinting at the existence within film and media industries or what in 1972 American thinker, thinker Susan Sontag named the double standard of aging. In this incredibly seminal contribution, Sontag described that, and I quote, growing older is mainly an ordeal of the imagination, a moral disease, a social pathology, intrinsic to which is the fact that afflicts women much more than men. It is particularly women which experience growing older with such distaste and shame. Being physically attractive counts much more in a woman's life than in a man's. But beauty, identified as it is for women with youthfulness, does not stand up well to age. Uh, it is worth gesturing to the fact that more than 50 years passed since Sontag published her reflections on said inequality, but little seems to have changed, at least within our field of inquiry, as we shall see later in detail. 
casting plays a non-negligible role in designing characters, the visibility of age, and reducing gender inequalities in the selection of performers. However, it is one of the least acknowledged professions within the film and media industry and an under-theorized one. To date, most of American and European professional recognitions do not include this activity. Neither does US Academy Awards, the Oscars, comprise this category, nor do French César, uh, Spanish Goya Awards, or German Deutsche Filmpreise. However, and I kindly ask to move to the uh, following slide, recent signs of change can be spotted. Since 2020, British Film Academy Awards, the BAFTA, bestow an award to the best casting. And from 2025 onward, the same will happen with the Italian David Di Donatello, which is what you see in the background uh, of my present of, of my face uh, behind me. This was the ceremony in 2021, if I'm not mistaken, of the David Di Donatello. But what kind of action does casting perform and how can it contribute at mitigating such disparities? The Collins Dictionary enumerates many meanings for the verb to cast. Most of them refer to an intentional action which expresses a political orientation to cast a vote, visually scrutinizes something to cast a look, questions an assumption to cast a doubt, projects a light or a shadow to cast a shadow, or tosses a line to fish <coughs> to cast a fishing line. However, one meaning is closer to what is at stake in casting for a film production, as the verb also describes the production of an artifact by pouring a liquid material into a mold to cast an object, and therefore bringing together intention, that is the mold, which designs a form, a shape, and unpredictability, the liquid material. In fact, when selecting performers for a role, Apparently, casting directors pour human material into the container that the character is. Though, selecting performers is itself an act of determination of what an abstract character is, which brings about a unique entity previous existing only in a virtual world. In an article published in British journal Screen at the height of semiotics craze in the late 1970s, John O. Thompson attempted at applying to the movies the commutation test that structural linguistics refer to for determining whether a component at the level of expression is relevant for the level of content or signifier signified, whatever you want to, to name them. Just to discover that when changing lead actresses and actors, the content is altered too. But the same doesn't go for minor roles, such as stunts or extras, which led the author to solicit a thorough survey of past and actual casting practices to determine in what ways selecting performers for roles is so crucial in shaping uh, the characters or how we perceive them. Casting practices, notably in the US and European film productions, need to balance the individual actors that are sets of bodily features, professional skills, and their persona, that is the coalescence of their public appearances fictional roles with a set of types that underpin the selection, a common knowledge associating bodies to social individual functions, no matter how this association is questionable. As a, a celebrated 19-teens and 1920s uh, American film star Mary Pickford stated, and the slide please, types, that is what casting comes to, first and last, the selection of proper types. And as you see in this uh, 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 image uh, in these uh, promotional materials of the famous famous player Slavsky, the production company Mary Pickford was working for, uh, the selection of stars and actors uh, somehow refers to a set of types. So typecast is, uh, typecasting is, in some way, the dark side of stardom, as a stardom is the narrative of individual self-fulfillment and personal achievement, because casting roots the professional, professional selection in pre-established, although mostly unconfessed, gender, class, ethnic, and racial categories. As Pamela Robertson Boychik uh, uh, remarked, casting is, and I quote, political practice, not only as a labor issue, 
but as touchstone for ideologies of, ident of identity. At the same time, typecasting in film is, to a large degree, inescapable, insofar as the business of film acting, and especially the star system, relies on recognizability, marketability, and the necessity for non-commodities." Thus, beyond an obvious assessment of, of acting skills and professional reliability, casting is based on the face and more generally on physical appearance. To sum up, typecasting brings about an embodiment that is, and I quote, the actions performed by the body, on the body, and through the body, which are oriented toward the social and which are both subject to and made salient to the reciprocal actions and expectations of the self and others, end quote. In some way, casting practices seem to perpetuate stereotypes and look for bodies which reinforce received wisdom as regards gender, race, ethnicity, disability, and age. Is there any space for innovation and transformation or positive actions? And how could such changes happen since casting relies on corporeality, that is the unmediated materiality of the body to produce the embodiment? Without the body, no embodiment. Amy Cook describes casting as an act of compression, as typification enhances some features while neglecting or downplaying others. Basically, through the cognitivist, cognitivist approach that Amy Cook uh, favors or relies on, the American scholar claims that casting brings to life characters by creating categories. And I quote, casting, like trailers, works to reduce the possibilities of a character. This, take this takes advantage of the cognitive process of compression. The same shorthand I rely on when I see a line drawing and know it represents a face. I argue that we use compression in casting, in naming, and in perceiving faces to efficiently make sense of the present and anticipate the future." End quote. However, bodies, mostly in and for themselves, provide the audience with an information which cannot be entirely concealed or suppressed. And I quote again from Amy Cook, some information is more visible than others. This is the information that the actor doesn't need to act and often cannot mask, end quote. Please for change in casting practices and opening opportunities for performers not belonging to the white majority in the United States, have been made since the mid-1940s, and notably the rise of the civil rights movement. The so-called non-traditional casting project, which dates back to 1986 and later, tellingly, changed its name to Alliance for the Inclusion in the Arts, advocated and fought for more equitable access to the roles in the American theater, cinema, and media overall. The movement created around non-traditional casting, or as recently renamed multicultural casting, led to a number of practices, enhancing extant stereotypes and taking for granted characters and roles, mostly bestowed to, on the white majority. Among them, a, a theoretician, Angela Pao, we might mention, and I kindly ask you to, 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 to move to the slide, colorblind casting, which implies assigning roles regardless of race, ethnicity, disabilities, disabilities, or if possible, gender, as is the case, just to mention a couple of Denzel Washington, who, who, who uh, incarnated Don Pedro in Much Do About Nothing by Kenneth Branagh in 1993, or much more recently, uh, Judy Dench, uh, who uh, interpreted uh, M, the, the, the head of the uh, uh, British Secret Service in 007 Skyfall by Sam Mendes in 2012. Secondly, the so-called societal casting, when performers embody the race, ethnicity, gender, or disability, they live in society as a whole. For instance, this is the case of uh, uh, Tony Cox uh, 
in Bad Santa by Terry Zwigow for uh, 2003. Third category, uh, conceptual casting. When the race, ethnicity, gender or disability of the performer are renounced to give resonance to the production. <coughs> this was the case of a recent Italian TV series, uh, Zero or Zero 2021, uh, with a cast uh, mostly made of second generation Italians, uh, which uh, basically incarnated uh, a, a, a group, uh, a, a band of ad adolescents uh, in uh, uh, the Italian uh, um, uh, impoverished uh, uh, metropolitan uh, neighborhoods. Unfortunately, the series was discontinued after the first season, but it uh, somehow marked uh, 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 a breaking point uh, in uh, traditional stereotypes associated with adolescence uh, and urban environments. And finally, as a last category, cross-cultural casting, when the story is dislodged from its initial setting and relocated into a different framework, may this be racial, ethnic, national, etc. And this is the case, for instance, of uh, Omar Sy, uh, in uh, the recent, recent French TV series uh, Lupin 2021-2023, which Gaumont produced and Netflix released. And the series somehow reconfigures through a second generation Fran Frenchman of African descent the renowned adventures of the gentleman thief created in 1905 by Maurice Leblanc, who somehow uh, represented a sort of uh, 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 French uh, Parisian uh, elegance. Uh, uh, this classification of non-traditional casting practices fits better in theater production, uh, where a canon of characters and stories is well established, and innovation by casting is measured against the background of, of, of decades or centuries of pre previous productions of the same play. This was the reason why I referred to um, Denzel Washington as Don Pedro in uh, uh, Shakespeare's uh, Much Ado About Nothing. Obviously, taking such a celebrated, uh, uh, world-renowned for centuries play, and uh, producing a non-traditional casting has a much more, a much bigger impact on the audience uh, than if you create uh, uh, from uh, from scratch uh, something with a with a casting that is not totally uh, predictable. Uh, however, uh, uh, even in film and media production. Uh, non-traditional casting can be effective. However, we all experience that uh, within our social and private lives, uh, making assumptions with regard to gender, class, race, and ethnicity is a, 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 a current practice. Casting against these assumptions, therefore, contributes at reshaping our expectations and how we experience society and individuals. To summarize, Casting can reinvent categories and assumptions neglected for racial, ethnic, gender, or disability reasons, and still neglect. And opportunities for an alternative and new understanding of the society we live in and the individuals we live next to. Can we also think of an age-blind casting? Apparently, age is not a binding factor on the stage since performers can incarnate characters beyond or before the biological age, which might, which might be a reason why non-traditional casting has barely theorized aging in theater. However, film and TV productions and their celebration of youthfulness and beauty are less keen in doing so. Furthermore, stars bring into films their persona, which orientates the narratives about their age. For instance, in the early 2000s, Jack Nicholson repeatedly incarnated an aging white man, but his persona uh, shifted away his characters from the representation of physical decay and solitude and tinted them with vitalism, lust, and an outsider's acute look onto social and human misery, which were somehow the brand of Jack Nicholson star's persona. The same goes more recently for Italy, where celebrated actor Sergio Castellitto embodied an embittered retired orphan with all the vital strength of his youth and the wisdom of his age. Awards increasingly acknowledge age performers, as was the case of 89 years old Sophia Loren, as compared to some decades ago, and therefore substantiate a shift 
toward a more accurate representation of our aging societies. Though, as Emma Thompson ironically pinpointed, opportunities are not the same for different genders. Does European film production implement strategies to mitigate the effects of inequality in casting? And I pass the torch to uh, Gloria. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. I will pick uh, up from here, but you uh, you are encouraged to consider Francesco and my part as a whole um, uh, lecture that we sort of designed together. And Francesco took care um, a little bit more about sort of the representation and the visual uh, conceptualization of casting, whereas I will uh, move a little bit towards um, social sciences, let's see, and towards also the labor implication of casting practices when it comes to diversity casting and age, uh, especially. So, over the last years, uh, statisticians, demographic experts, and media commentators have been sounding the alarm about the rapid aging of the European population. Indeed, recent data from Eurostat show that the European Union population above 65 years of age has increased 3.1% between 2012 and 2022, and now accounts for over 21% of the total. Increased life expectancy and decline in birth rates are the main contributing factors behind this trend, uh, although some countries are more affected than others. In Italy in particular, um, the country where, where Francesco and I live, um, Italy is the European country with the highest median age of the population, 48 years against a European median of 44. Italians over 65 make up almost one quarter of the population. And as you can see from this 2018 title of the Frankfurter Allgemeine, there are less and less children, bambini, being born in Italy. Germany is also affected, although here um, the uh, higher immigration rates contribute more decisively to balance such aging trend. Um, as a result of this phenomenon, age is an increasingly hot topic in public discourses around politics, sociology, economy, and culture, and the same can be said for academic debates. After decades of limited, if any, interest in the subject, film and media scholars, too, have started to pay more systematic attention to the question of age, and uh, the project led by Professor Hedegaard is one example of this. In these slides, you can see some examples of recent English language academic publications that deal in various ways with age and screen media, notably in correlation with the dimension of gender. Women, celebrity and cultures of aging, gender and sexuality in the European media, exploring different contexts through concept conceptualization of age, women aging and screen industries, and aging masculinities in contemporary European and Anglophone cinema. Now, if we consider it from a film studies perspective, age can and should be seen as a critical factor that, much like gender, intersects and influences a number of macro and micro level phenomena and decision-making processes, such as industry, organization, and professional practices, job opportunities and career trajectories of talents, as well as audience box office preferences and perception of what old age and aging mean and look like, just like Francesco's examples have shown. Now, in a moment, we will delve into some of these age-related economic, industrial and cultural phenomena and how they translate into the everyday experience of film industry professionals with the help of um, Lilia Hartmann Trapani's uh, testimony. But first, um, I wanted to introduce and discuss a key concept which has rather surprisingly received little attention by film scholars so far, which is the concept of screen age. Screen age sometimes also referred to as playing age, is an industry term that indicates the age that an actor, 
can convincingly portray when appearing on screen. Screen age is routinely referenced in both above the line and below the line material, such as scripts. And here you can see uh, an example, a page describing one of the opening scene of Sofia Scopola 2003 movie Lost in Translation, which you probably uh, know with the education of the age range for what turned out to be Bill Murray's character's late 40s. Uh, casting calls, this is, these are two real casting calls published on the mandy.com and backstage.com, two popular US uh, job and networking platforms used by creative professionals to look for uh, co-workers. As you can see, the age range and the gender are the most prominent criteria put forward by producer and casting director when looking at, in this case, a leading female uh, between the age of 18 and 35 and a leading male role between 35 and 60, uh, also with the indication of the, uh, the name of the character. And Screen Age also appears regularly on talent online platforms. Um, these are two screenshots, two actual screenshots. They are publicly um, available. You can, uh, uh, it's public data, let's see. Um, they are taken from Italenta, which is Europe's leading casting platform, or one of Europe's leading casting platforms where actors can upload their personal information, photos, CVs, and reels, so that casting directors looking for suitable candidates for acting roles can learn about them and hopefully get in touch for an audition. And by the way, I, I open uh, sort of a, a bracket here as British film scholar Paul McDonald remarked, job seeking of which self-promotion and networking um, our integral components is by all means an essential part of the labor of acting. So acting is not just about performing um, an acting job, but it's also very much about looking for acting jobs. So actors in, in this kind of uh, online uh, profiles, actors decide which personal detail to include and make visible uh, on the platform. The age range, which you can see highlighted with the uh, arrow, age range is always present. Uh, and age range refers here to the biological age spectrum that an actor believes to be able to convincingly portray on screen. And as you can see, the, this actor has decided to include both his screen age uh, between 19 and 29 years, and his chronological age, 28 years old. On the right, the actress instead, in this case, has decided to omit her chronological age and only indicated the screen age, a 13-year spectrum between 17 and 30 years old. Now, it is important to remark that regardless of the age range that an actor attributes to himself or herself, the final evaluation about the appropriate screen age and the one, the only one that really matters is made by the casting director. Now, defining what age appropriateness means is not as straightforward as we may think. Assessing how the outward sign of a particular age manifests themselves on an actor's face and body, and how such signs can be used to convey meaning about a particular character in a film is one of the many complex decisions that a casting director is tasked with. The factors contributing to this decision are both film specific, as they depend on the background, the identity of the character, and the film genre, among other things. But they are also culturally specific, as different ages are 
typified in different ways across different cultures. Uh, if you think about it, one person may be considered very old or, you know, tending towards a more older age when, you know, they are in their 50s, depending on which country they live in, in which country, in which culture they live in. And in this regard, I would like to introduce the final point of my talk, which concerns the practice of screenwriting and consequently the casting of actors and actresses across different film cultures and different sociocultural contexts, which is the topic of gendered age discrimination uh, applying to the labor practices of acting and casting. So as you may know, the acting job market is characterized by an oversupply of talents. And so competition for lending interest in screen role is very tough as you know, if you have some acting experience or if you have any friends who are actors, you, you, you may very well know this. Casting directors are the official gatekeepers who control access, not only to acting jobs, uh, whose allocation is ultimately decided by the director, but to the very possibility of competing for an acting job, so the access to auditions. Therefore, for actors attracting the attention of a casting director so that he or she may even briefly consider them potentially eligible for a role is of paramount importance. And in this sense, the broader an actor's age range is, the higher his or her chances are to be eligible for job opportunities. As a result of that, and as also Lilia Hartman Trapani confirmed to me in a previous conversation, actors tend to stretch their self-declared screen age as much as possible. And since screen media offer more roles for young talent rather than older ones, actors tend to stretch their age range downwards, as we have seen also with, with this example. Mm -hmm. This is a 28 years old actor and his age range is you know, skewed toward the, let's see, the younger side. Uh, so let's see some figures in this regard. In US film and TV shows, um, as well as in French cinema, uh, which is the biggest European market in terms of number of film produced and, and box office, characters over 50 years old account for 24 and 23 percent of the total respectively. But if we look at the gender breakdown of this data, we can see that women, when, uh, when 50 plus characters appear, they are much more likely to be men than women, actually 81% versus 19%. Uh, here you can see the gender gap. So this is the number of 50 plus characters in all uh, US films and most popular TV and streaming shows of the, least, of the latest decade or so. And among the 50 plus characters, uh, this is the proportion of female and male roles. The gender ratio is a bit better if we look at French cinema, where women over 50 account for 32% of the total 50 plus film roles, but these numbers still mean that once past the age of 50, there are less than half as many roles for French actresses as there are for French actors. In such a context, it is not surprising that it is mainly the actress's interest to keep their screen age as low as possible and sometimes to conceal their chronological age altogether, as we have seen uh, done by uh, the actress in, in the Italy profile, especially as they move past their 30s, precisely in order to sidestep possible biases on the part of the casting staff. This is especially the case for non so-called A-list actresses whose personal information are not as much in the public domain as Hollywood stars. 
In this regard, an exemplary case of what uh, Susan Sontag described as the double standard of aging, which Francesco discussed, is the case of Judy Hong, uh, this person here. Judy Hong is an American actress who sued in 2011, sued for $1 million, the Amazon owned film platform internet movie database, IMDB, um, for publishing her chronological age without her consent. The actress claimed that before IMDb Pro made known that she was in her 40s, she used to be regularly cast to play characters in, the, in their 20s and 30s. And that this information, the information regarding her chronological age, led her to miss job opportunities. The, um, the Screen Actors Guild and the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, uh, this is, uh, Oh, sorry, this is one excerpt from uh, Johnny Hong's complaint. If one is perceived to be over the hill, uh, which means approaching 40s, it is nearly impossible for an up and coming actress such as the plaintiff to get work as she's thought to have less of an upside. The, um, the Screen Actors Guild and the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists strongly backed, supported Hong's case saying that IMDb was, quote, facilitating age discrimination, unquote, and remarking the difference between chronological and screen age in acting labor. So the union said, an actor's actual age is irrelevant to casting. What matters is the age range that an actor can portray. For the entire history of professional acting, this has been true. But the reality has been appended by the development of IMDb as an industry standard used in casting offices across America. Now, how did it end? The court eventually decided in favor of IMDb, citing the right of the website to provide accurate information under the First Amendment of the US Constitution which protects freedom of speech, uh, essentially. However, uh, the uh, uh, Screen Actors Guild and the AFTRA unions and other entertainment industry associations like GLAD continued to pressure and eventually convinced IMDb to implement a policy that allows actors and other film professionals to remove their birth rate, uh, their date of birth, uh, birth names and other personal information of potentially sensitive nature from their website so as to reduce the chance of discrimination based particularly on ageist and transphobic biases. Indeed, um, diversity is increasingly becoming a major drive in decision-making processes within the film industry, including those regarding casting. And so, uh, in order to sort of address this and these related questions, we uh, decided to invite, to engage in our lecture, uh, uh, a casting director, Lilia Hartmann Trapani, um, who I ask just to double check if she is with us. Uh, Lilia, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you just a oh, moment. Oh, great, great. <laughs> I will, I will just move um, a couple of slides. I will show a couple of slides more just to introduce you properly. And then we will switch to the uh, webcam mode so that everyone uh, can see you. So um, Lydia is the founder um, of Studio T, which is an international casting and film service company based in Rome. Here you can see the logo. Uh, Lydia has a long and prestigious resume. She has founded, um, uh, she has founded Studio T in 1985. She has experience working across the cinema, television, as well as advertising. She has collaborated with Italian and international directors of the likes of Liliana Cavani, Manuel de Oliveira, Lasse Armstrong, Marco Risi, Ridley Scott, Matti Scorsese, and others. Here you can see some of just some of the 
uh, projects that she has worked on, just a, a little selection, uh, by no mean, um, you know, exhaustive. Uh, cinema, some of the films she has worked on, um, as well as in television. These are some of her latest uh, uh, works for uh, television, scripted uh, shows. Uh, Lilia has also authored a book published in Italy in 2020 titled Il Mestiere di Casting Director, The Profession of Casting Director, in which she provides insights into her profession as well as you know, sharing uh, advices, practical advices to prospective actors. She is a member of all the major casting director associations, both in Italy and internationally. Uh, Unione Italiana Casting Director, the Casting Society of America. She's also a member of the European Film Academy and a board member of the International Casting Director Network. And last year, in 2023, she was the recipient of an Artios Award. She is the award uh, given by the Casting Society of America for her location casting work uh, for the third season of HBO award-winning drama series Succession, which is one of my very personal favorite. Uh, so thank you very much, Lilia, for being with us. I will now uh, sort of switch mode so we can see you and we can see Francesco. Here you are. Thank you very much, Lilia, for being with us. Um, I don't know if you have a uh, uh, listen to the presentation if there was something you wanted to uh you know if you wanted to say something to immediately or if we can start uh, sort of with our questions and curiosity and i would say francesco and i will will start and then we can also we, we, open the floor to questions we have plenty of questions for lydia whom uh, i also would like to heartily thank for being with us um sorry for being in this more hybrid remote, but I'm pretty much sure that uh, there's much to, to be discussed. But if you want to get started, Lydia, otherwise uh, I might uh, I might pave the way for discussion. With the... First of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure of participating to this uh, meeting. And uh, it I have listened to all your uh, lectures. It's very interesting. So I'm very glad to collaborate if I can help you anyway <laughs> to clarify the question. So please. All right. Thank you. Because <laughs> one of the things we've been uh, tapping on and, and Gloria mentioned that the word exactly was uh, casting directors as gatekeepers. Casting directors somehow, somehow must uh, interpret or turn into uh, a practical selection process uh, uh, what producers and directors uh, look for but at the same time they must forecast they must they must they must somehow uh, envision what the audience might request when it comes to uh, faces bodies uh, performers so in this kind of double bind, what is the room for innovation and change, in your opinion? So first of all, um, being called a gatekeeper makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. I, I have never felt myself like a, a gatekeeper. Uh, how can I, I? I just would like to explain very briefly how our job works. So uh, the first thing we do is uh, when we are contacted for, when we are hired for uh, a project, is of course to read the <clears throat> the script, and to well to to study and make a list of the characters. Uh, very often there is an age near the name of the character, but not always. So once we have the list and the idea of all the characters we will be looking for, <clears throat> the most important thing to do is to discuss it with the producer on one side and with the director on the other. 
because from the producer we must first of all acknowledge which are his goals for the movie which will be the distribution if which is the budget of the movie because of course the the actors that can propose for a role de depend on, upon the the budget also and so if he if the for which role uh, the production uh, needs a so-called bankable actor. Bankable actor is an actor that in some way assures uh, <clears throat> that the movie will maybe be a blockbuster. So someone that will attract the, <clears throat> the public. Uh, so these are the information that we need from the producers. From the director, of course, we must discuss his his view of the character and the, and the, his um, <clears throat> how he imagines the, the the character to be the uh, and the, the idea of the director not always uh, corresponds to the idea that we have built up in our minds while we were <clears throat> reading the script. So once we have all this information, we must think about which are the actors that can more correspond to the role and which are the actors that can somehow give add a value to the role, make it richer, more interesting. And here we sometimes have a possibility to to give uh, an input that is new because maybe the director had imagined an actor of a certain type and we can say if we have something in mind that can be interesting why don't we consider uh, an actor that is not exactly of the same age or that is maybe a woman and not a man or a man and not a woman or which is uh, maybe not a, a, a Caucasian actor, but maybe an African or an Oriental actor. Why not? It could be interesting nowadays. So there is a, there is a, a space in which we can um, uh, try to, to, to change a little bit the, the way. Not always, but sometimes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's, first of all, I just wanted to very, very briefly, by raising your hand, are you all familiar with the, the work of casting directors? I mean, before Lilia explained, have you sort of, do you know a little bit about it? Or I see some head shaking. Yeah, so it's it's true that it's, it's, it's also Francesco mentioned is a kind of a um, under theorized and also sort of miss uh, not misunderstood, but it's a little bit of a neglected sort of profession in the, I mean, in the public domain. I mean, everyone knows the producer, everyone knows the director, everyone knows the stars, obviously, but the casting director is one of those roles which is a little bit, you know, hidden in the background, but actually plays a crucial role in the final look of the film, and also as, as Lilia was saying in the potentially, you know, in the success, commercial success of the film. And as you said, Lilia, you, you have mentioned how you, you try to sort of propose some alternatives to the director sometimes, uh, uh, trying to, you know, cast against, you know, proposing some sort of unexpected options for some characters. And we have talked and, and a lot has been written recently about so-called diversity casting. Mm -hmm. So what is your experience with that? Also, because you, you are based in Rome, you work in Italy, but you have, as we have seen also, um, uh, an established uh, experience working with international projects and international co-productions. So you have experienced also different um, professional cultures. So I, I wanted to, to ask you a little bit about, based on your experience, uh, what is the, you know, how, uh, like the Italian uh, film industry and other industry that you may 
have worked with compare in terms of you know how open to so-called diversity casting they are and you know how does it work yes uh, <clears throat> i must say that uh um, in um, UK and in the States, they are much more open to diversity casting because it's also a little bit a trend now. So uh, without going to the extreme of uh, Bridgerton, for instance, um, but we there there is much more uh, the habit to use. Uh, <clears throat> known Caucasian actors to use disabled actors and uh, much more uh, also gender diversity. In Italy, we are a little bit um, at the beginning of this process. That I trust that it will go ahead, but uh, it's still... Uh, it's it's starting to say and uh, the problem is also very much that uh, it, it doesn't depend so much on upon the casting director rather than upon the <clears throat> the screenwriter because if they don't write roles then uh, we can do very few. Yes, we can suggest to use a, a, a different, uh, follow a different direction uh, on on roles that are already written in a certain way. But it would be much more interesting if the screenwriters would also uh, write roles uh, for diversity characters. Do you have any opportunity for sort of uh, lobbying, let's say, uh, for this kind of, you know, uh, lobbying screenwriters to, you know, uh, write more sort of diverse stories? Uh, we haven't done it yet, but um, in our Italian association, we are now uh, putting together a, a group that will take care of this item that's with uh, diversity and inclusion. And we are thinking to to uh, get in touch with the screenwriters to to pose them the question, why don't you write more roles in this new direction? But uh, it's it's a, a it's a long lasting process, but it's it's going on. So I I trust that it will happen in in the near future. Uh, this is interesting because uh, as regards more ethnic or uh, uh, racial non traditional casting, uh, I mentioned an example which was a. Uh, an unlucky one, zero or zero, but uh, Bangla, both the film and the series were met quite a huge success just for the, our our German audience. Uh, uh, Bangla is the story of uh, a character who lives uh, in, the, in the outskirts of Rome in a multi-ethnic uh, uh, neighborhood uh, and he's of uh, uh, Bangladesh. Uh, 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 origins, but he's been born and raised uh, in Rome. His family still has fond memories of his background and his uh, uh, origins, but he's much more interested in uh, somehow finding his place uh, in the society, within the society he lives in. And it was quite a success. So it seems there's room for change, but uh, uh, stereotypes or Certain traditional rationality tend to tend to prevail. So I was wondering, what is your impression uh, when discussing? What, what is how are the reactions by screenplay writers and uh, 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 um, you know, practitioners when you somehow toss on the table new input? <laughs> Well, um, let me mention also uh, a TV series on which I worked uh, recently and which I particularly love, which is Unwanted. I think that's print also in Germany. It's a Sky production. 
And for this production, uh, well, it's the story of uh, a cruising ship that meets during the, his uh, sailing. Um, how do you say? It? And, uh, a, a shipwreck. So there are uh, naufragies in the in the water, and they are saved by the captain and the by the crew of the cruising ship. And there is then this, uh, this contrast, the problems that are created in on the cruising ship between the, <clears throat> the cruisers that were paying and were rich and uh, white people and these uh, naufragies, these uh, that are uh, very poor and desperate and it's it has been a very very interesting uh, work, but this said, these uh, these characters, these African characters, were African characters, were uh, migrants, or in Bangla, the other series that you mentioned, the uh, the characters were people from Bangladesh. What is missing is. To to use a, a, a multi to do a multi ethnic casting for roles that were once conceived for uh, Caucasian uh, actors, for instance, when you, when we have a doctor, the role of a doctor, why has the doctor to be white male and uh, forty? Why couldn't he be a uh, a, uh, a woman. Why could the doctor not be a black? Why not? Why could he not be older? Uh, there, uh, there are stereotypes always for certain uh, the roles of certain professions of certain characteristic that are they must be uh, wide. Uh, of a certain age, uh, of a certain class, uh, it's very difficult to to try to change the mind about these kind of roles. Because one thing is we we have uh, uh, actors that uh, represent another ethnicity, and one other thing is we have. Uh, roles that are um, uh, European roles, but they are could be interpreted by uh, black actors, or um, I don't know if I, I. Yeah, sure, sure. No, it's clear. It's uh, you know, we we don't always. I mean, we will move forward once we don't only cast you know uh, African descendant actors to play, you know, poor immigrants, but also, you know, when we don't have to thematize racial differences, when we can simply, you know, visualize it as, you know, the character of the lawyer or the love interest or, you know, whatever. Um, so no, no, you, you've been absolutely clear. And I just wanted to ask you because we are talking, so, I mean, you have mentioned, you have mentioned so far more, you know, diversity in terms of racial difference and ethnicity. What about age? Because age is, is really something that is possibly less visible in a way, or it's less, let's say, uh, obvious a difference uh, mm, uh, compared to other identity dimensions. So where do you think that, you know, Italian productions, but also other production based on your experience, where do we stand in terms of opportunities for actors above, I don't know, 55, 60 years of age? Well, again, here is the question, uh, the, the roles must be written, because it, in, in, for age, okay. it is a little bit difficult to say, let's uh, interpret it, uh, a, a certain professional over a certain age, because it it would be not realistic, not very realistic. But, but this said, uh, I have the impression that um, the opportunities for actors of a certain age are increasing because I think the reason is also because the audience is uh, getting older. 
So when you go to a theater, movie theater, uh, usually in the afternoon, the people that are watching a movie are all over over sixty or over seventy. So uh, <laughs> I think that uh, this has also a marketing reason. It because the audience is getting older, so they the audience want to see all the people on the screen doing doing nice things not only playing a, <laughs> a retired person but working uh, and having adventures and having a, a, a life an interesting life this happens a lot in 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 the states with the american movies because you have, you know there is this uh, uh, lecture club i think it's called the movie with the uh, Jane Fonda and Diane Keaton and uh, I don't remember the other two, but these are movies that are written and produced for an older audience. Uh, so uh, I I think the that these sort of movies and are uh, are increasing. They are more and more produced. So in this direction, is <laughs> I think we can be optimistic. It is interesting what you mentioned because um, um, uh, it, I was referring to a, a couple of of, 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 uh, of examples that were a TV series for uh, race diversity casting, and you refer to a movie as regards age uh, representation. And this uh, somehow leads me to to another thing that uh, that occurred to me. Um, the U.S. statistics show uh, a telling difference as regards diversity casting between um, uh, feature film production and TV series. By that meaning, the TV series uh, uh, are have a bigger room for diversity casting than feature films. So I was wondering, is in your experience, uh, is it the same in Italy or in Europe, having you a, a, a broad experience? And do you think that, for instance, a, a film production might host uh, age diversity casting and leaving more room for ethnic, racial, or disability diversity casting to film production? Uh, no, in fact, I I I don't have this feeling. I I I never thought about this, but I I I don't have the impression that TV series are more uh, open. No, I wouldn't say this. In my experience, no. <laughs> No, but what, what for instance, uh, I mean, to, in my experience as a, a scholar and mostly a consumer as regards TV series, I'm no TV series specialist at all, but uh, I see very little stories uh, uh, concerning uh, aging in TV series. And as you say, in the book club is, uh, is the, the, the title of the film. You yes. have an increasing film production, which is, which relies around or focuses on on aging uh, experience, and I, I, I we uh, it was the, the the cornerstone of our project. We uh, film production is changing, and because the the audience is changing. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> we totally agree with you, and uh, we are we are so, happy that you confirm our our starting point and impression. Absolutely, <laughs> but also um, I think that uh, the same could be said. I in, in I have the feeling that the same could be said about TV series because I think that uh, also the audience for TV series is getting older. I don't think that teenagers watch TV series. Maybe they watch other uh, another sort of things. They watch videos, uh, these kind of things, but they don't watch traditional TV series. Rather, uh, uh, elderly people will watch them. 
That's interesting. That's a, that's a perspective. <laughs> so there are a lot of possibilities for older actors to be <laughs> hired, I think. In fact, for instance, now uh, in Italy, uh, Marco Risi has directed a movie which is called The Punto di Rogiata, which plays in a house for retired people. So things are coming. So there is a, an increasing interest in it's this. It's on our list, uh, uh, the film. <laughs> It's a, it's Are already that... it's on our list. It's it's oh. on our viewing list. Oh okay okay. <laughs> I didn't see it yet, but uh, neither. It's coming great. out now. Yes, yeah. I think it will be a nice movie because Mark Rizzi is a very good director. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that, and, and then I will you know open the floor if there are any comments, uh, especially or you know what we what we mentioned. How does it compare to your own experience as? film consumers and, and TV series consumers. What you mentioned, Lilia, the, the fact that there seems to be, at least anecdotally, an increasing number of roles for aging stars, uh, I think, you know, it, it takes us back to what you mentioned about the notion of uh, bankable actors, right? So the fact that, you know, stars do age, as we all do, and so if, if you know, uh, Francesco has uh, Sofia Loren there, but, you know, there are a number of other actors who, you know, started their career uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and, uh, you know, got very successful and continues to sort of keep their, um, their fame and their success into the middle age and third age. And this is probably something that, can help maybe, you know, the industry to sort of creating new opportunities, new storylines, new roles uh, for aging stars, because there is, you know, these actors, uh, you know, still bring audiences to film theater. Uh, I want to, to point uh, out one, uh, one point. There are actors that, or actresses, that are, able to age, that are aging well, how can I say, that accept their changes and they can be hired for roles of older people. And there are others that don't accept it. They would like to be hired always for the for younger role or unluckily actresses that uh, change their faces uh, in order to look younger, especially actresses that have based their career upon their beauty and their being sexy. And when they their sexual appeal uh, diminishes, they don't accept it. And these are very difficult to use because they you cannot use them anymore as, as sex symbols, but you cannot use them in, uh, as for other roles like a professor, a mother, a grandmother. So it's it depends a lot on how the actors accept to to grow older. That, that, yeah, that, that's a very good point. That's that's actually a very interesting point. Um I don't know, Francesco, if you have if you wanted to add something or can... No, I, I mean we have I guess uh, 15 minutes left and uh uh I, I wonder if uh, within the audience, uh, which I just barely see a little surprise of, uh, uh, there are any questions. I would leave the uh, I would leave the the ground to them. Vincent has a question. Yeah, th thank you uh, for fantastic presentations and for this uh, wonderful and enlightening enlightening uh, conversation. Thanks, Lilio, for taking the time to, to participate here. This is uh, truly valued. Um, <clears throat> uh, as you were you were discussing television series just before, it's a, you know, there aren't a whole lot of examples of television series where aging uh, plays an important role. And obviously, I was uh, searching for counter examples. 
And uh, what came to my mind is that we're currently, like in these days, witnessing the celebration for the, the celebrations for the 25th anniversary of the start of The Sopranos, um, the American television series about the dysfunctional, the mob as a dysfunctional family, the the the, <clears throat> the mobster has panic attacks and uh, goes goes to therapy, and uh, this this seems relevant here for for two reasons. First of all, part of the celebration is that the 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 actors who played the characters in the show and who are still alive are being trotted out to celebrate the anniversary, like uh, Lorraine Bracco. Uh, Michael Imperioli, who now has a schlock of white hair and is no longer a young man, um, and and so they they very much perform their their biological age as opposed to their screen age uh, in the series, and it's an important part of the narrative of the commemoration of the series at this point that you know Bracco and, and Imperioli go to the Emmys and have a special appearance, and it's very much about them having aged um, beyond the age of their on-screen characters. And the other thing that that struck me as I was watching some of the videos was an, an interview with David Chase, the showrunner, the creator of the show, where the interviewer asked him if the writers had any preferred characters on the show. And he said, yes, there were two, namely, Livia, Tony Soprano's mother, played by Mancy Marchan, who uh, died in 2000 and basically disappeared from the show because the actress was no longer available. And the other favorite character was the other old guy, Junior, uh, played by Dominic Chionese, um, who is, by the way, still alive. He's 92 years old. And <clears throat> who was already in, in The Godfather in, in 1972, by the way. And, and what's interesting is that those are the two characters that the writers like to, to write the most. I mean, they're interesting, mean, terrible people. And they sort of go against the character, or against the, the perception that old people are somehow <clears throat> benign and graced uh, with special wisdom. They're definitely not that, you know, they're the, the nastiest, the, old age characters that you will find on American television, I think, ever. Uh, <clears throat> but I just found it interesting that, that the writers actually write, liked to write those characters and probably given more opportunities to do so, they will create more characters like that. And I don't know, maybe Lydia, you have some experience uh, engaging with writers uh, at, at different levels. <clears throat> um, you know, would there be more characters like that if were if writers were given free reign or, um, yeah? No, sorry, I, I I didn't understand your question very well. Sorry, I'm simply I I will just repeat because I think the audio is a bit yes uh, yes okay. from there. The question Vincent asked was essentially, you know, given the example of the Sopranos, for example. Uh, uh, and other, you know, scripted shows where the writers had a profound interest in writing older characters. Uh, he asked, based on your experience, do you think that if they, if writers were given, you know, more room for, you know, expressing themselves as they want, do you think that they would like to write more roles for older characters, which I think but I, this is myself speaking, I think sort of implies that there, there may be some sort of tension between what the screenwriter as an artist wants and, you know, the TV commissioner or the broadcaster or, you know, uh, the, the, the platforms uh, uh, that commission the works. Well, yes, I, I think they, they would be happy to do so because, uh, I mean, they can build up a very uh, profound and interesting character uh, writing about an older person. Uh, we have so plenty of teenagers and of young uh, guys and girls, and we are uh, overwhelmed by uh, stories of uh, young uh, guys that are rarely profound. So I think that it 
the screenwriter would be very happy to write more about uh, more mature characters. And I think that it will come. Let me ask you a question just because, you know, I take advantage of my physical presence here and take advantage of this captive audience, which I think are probably, you know, starting to think about maybe going for an apero, but <laughs> stick, with, stick with us just a few more minutes. Uh, I mean, the the, the, the people that, that are here with us are, and again, judging, you know, from your screen age, you are probably around 20 to 25 years old, something like that. So I would like to ask you if you, you know, would you be interested or are you interested or have you been interested in watching films and TV shows and content about older character or, you know, I, I see some nodding. Yes, that's the point, yes, of course. <laughs> so, okay, so, you know, we have, you know, empirical proof that there is an audience also among, you know, Gen Z uh, for, you know, older characters to be depicted. So I think that is a great, you know, way. Well, actually, also, I was thinking, you know, as Vincent mentioned The Soprano, I was also thinking about another amazing old character, old and disabled character, the, you know, the bad guy from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, uh, the Mexican um, drug lord. Uh, Hector Salamanca. Yeah, Hector Salamanca. The, the yeah, he is nastier. Yeah, he is nastier than, than the Sopranos. Yeah. <laughs> well, Livia wants to kill his her son, so I don't know if it gets any more evil than that, you know. Hmm. But it's true that in the quality television series, you have very, very evil old people. In like in the Breaking Bad, Hector Solomonco is, is a nasty piece of work. Um, and, and, and again, uh, uh, Junior and, and Livio in, in The Sopranos, terrible, terrible people. Any other examples? Mean old people in television? <laughs> Well, actually, I mean, Livia worked on, you know, we mentioned your Arceus Award for Succession, and also, you know, Brian Cox's yes. character, you know, that's another, you know, I don't know if he's evil, but he's, I mean, he's certainly leaning toward, you know, mean, be mean. Yes, but we are mentioning all men. Yeah, thank you. Exactly, exactly. That's why Livio is so important. <laughs> that, that's no, that, that's true. We have, you know, that, that is probably goes back to, you know, what we mentioned about the double standard. You know, we have more complex, we allow old characters to be, you know, more complex and nuanced if they are male rather than female, perhaps. Well, but I, I there have... is this, this movie. Uh, oh, oh interpreted by Sophia Lauren that is behind uh, yeah. behind Francesco and uh, this was a wonderful movie and uh, and this was a, a, a very old lady in the movie so sometimes it happens <laughs> that it's a woman but rarely rarely yeah rarely and uh, <laughs> uh, as we all know in uh, the life ahead uh, it was a uh, as director, it was uh, Sophia Lawrence's uh, ah, son, yes. <laughs> which obviously was a facilitating uh, uh, factor, uh, plus the brand of such such a celebrity that still somehow exerts some power on, on the audience. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, a good deal of uh, major uh, actresses incarnating aging, aging characters uh, stem from the UK film production. Think of Ellen Mirren or Judy Dench to yeah. uh, Ellen Mirren uh, as uh, oh, Queen Elizabeth II uh, uh, or Judy Dench in Iris, uh, about Iris Murdoch. But what is interesting is that uh, roles are celebrating age uh, as regards uh, women are often uh, biopics where the fact of having somebody aging 
is motivated by the fact that the real <laughs> life person she incarnates was in uh, in her late days. And this is also, I mean, as regards screenwriting, I think an issue that needs to be to be pinpointed or raised. Um, uh, what uh, as regard, I mean, if uh, I sh might uh, just add uh, some some information as regards the statistics uh, to to follow up with what uh, what Gloria was saying, we we have as regards uh, British and US. Uh, uh, theme production, uh, uh, we have uh, a few uh, role for uh, aging women. They are more or less the same as men, but uh, usually the narrative relevance of the roles uh, is much smaller, and so are the lines of dialogue. So I think there is really a wide open room for, for uh, contemporary European film and media production and room for us, both as practitioners, as uh, as Lydia is, uh, and uh, and scholars, for advocating for for a change, which somehow represents uh, in a more accurate way what we are today. I think we can sort of move towards a wrap up. Um, yeah. So thank you very much, Lydia, for it. For, I don't know where to look. I have the screen. You have. You are here, but I mean, uh, thank you very much for joining us. No, no, am I wrong? Yes, 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 it's correct. Now you're looking yeah. at me. I'm not a great actress, as you can see. Don't behave well, you know, for the camera. Uh, no, thank you very much. It was really enriching, and and again, I think it's. Um, it encourages, you know, also everyone to sort of look at the more hidden, let's say, uh, hidden part of, you know, filmmaking and film industry, which, you know, uh, actually plays a, a very, very, very important role in, you know, what we end up seeing in our screen. So it was very interesting for me, too. So I... I enjoyed it. <laughs> Francesco, I, I leave it up to you for, you know, the closing remark. No, I mean, uh, I think, uh, I think what, uh, uh, through, through the discussion with Lydia, uh, we, we focus better as regards our research activity is that, uh, um, uh, uh interviews, uh, and, uh, uh, somehow, uh, an exchange with, uh, uh, casting directors, but also screenwriters, uh, is of paramount importance for um, mm, uh, advancing, for progressing in our research project. And uh, as regards uh, how uh, somehow we operate with types when uh, both selecting uh, uh, performers, but also designing roles, characters for the performers, uh, is uh, still something that needs to be uh, discussed uh, in wide detail because it relies or it is rooted in our common experience, uh, no matter how we think of ourselves that we are free from uh, uh, profiling, but still it is something that is there. And uh, uh, it is good to, that uh, it is brought into discussion because uh, uh, without awareness, uh, there can be no progress. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you to Gloria for uh, somehow connecting us. Uh, uh, unfortunately, she's been really uh, uh, um, substantially framed by uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, unexpected uh, situation. Really thank you, Gloria, for uh, uh, taking center stage and somehow helping us. And thank you again to all the audience that despite uh, uh, the uh, severe uh, weather conditions could join us. And uh, uh, thank you to, 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 to Vincent and to the Cornelia Gete Centrum and uh, uh, Amanda Glanert for uh, 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 helping us to put this together. It was, uh, it was a sheer pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>